Guys, welcome back to another Steven Revisiverse episode. Today we're looking at episodes again, which means we looked at Giant Woman last time, so that means... Uh, so many birthdays and... Lars and the Cool Kids next, I think. Double check that, make sure I'm not an idiot. Well, more so than usual. Anyway. Yep, that is actually correct. Cool, very good. Um, so, let's get everything brought up that we need to do that, because I, um, do not have the foresight to do that before I start recording the episode. Where is it? There it is. Okay, cool. And as been the pattern with these lately, we're going to be looking at my original thoughts on the episodes back when I reviewed them the first time, and then the episodes, and I'm going to give commentary and thoughts and stuff. This is a, this is a couple of interesting ones, but... I'm a little worried that I've said everything I need to say about these, so I don't know how involved this video is going to be. I'm not, I'm not really sure. So many birthdays, an episode that I have a really bad habit of calling too many birthdays and might during this video, so please excuse if I do. Not something you have to worry about during this video. I've apparently outgrown that. I didn't even remember that that used to be a thing. Also, I still have this shirt. It's, it's very much falling apart, but I still own it. Should really wear it again, just for funsies. Episode, like several episodes of this show, in fact, is more interesting as a talking point than it is an actual work of fiction. What an interesting way to put it. And actually, I mean, granted, I didn't actually know which episodes we were talking about today until I sat down and looked at this. But um, the minute I saw it was this one, I was actually kind of thinking something similar. Like, um, I like this episode, don't get me wrong, but I think I know where past me is going with that. Like, um... We'll, we'll get to it when we get to it. You'll see. Looking for the source of some smell, it's it's a piece of food that she's left there way too long, and it has started to rot. It's funny scene. And what is important is that Stephen finds this old portrait of the gems and Rose, and it looks like some humans, too. Hold on. Are there humans in that? With them? Oh, jeez. It looks like there are. I'd forgotten about that. That's interesting. Anyway, I, I shall allow myself to continue now. Something I need to look into, though. That might that might be interesting. Also, I, I think it bears pointing out, it is very, very cool that Garnet got to punch a shark. And this is the episode where we find out that gems are ageless. Calling them immortal is incorrect. Don't call them immortal. I will argue with you. Immortal means that you are incapable of dying. Ageless just means you won't die of aging. And that's basically what I was getting at before. This, this, this is the episode that, like, People in the fandom still call them immortal. I, I, I like... There are some words, especially in fiction, don't have to mean what they usually mean, right? It, it's fiction, but for some reason I have a real issue with the misuse of this one. Like, people are like, oh, vampires call themselves immortal too, and they can be killed. Yeah, I know, but vampires are supposed to be, like, narcissistic assholes, right? Like, they call themselves immortal because it makes them feel like they're hot shit. Right? The gems are actually very much like the traditional vampire. They don't age, at least not traditionally. It seems like they have, like, some difficulty in changing with time. Like, they don't, like, mature the way that a human would. They're kind of set in their ways. And they're particularly hard to kill, but it's not impossible. <clears throat> Sorry about that. One of my dogs was... Off the right fit somewhere in the depths of my house, and I had to go figure out what was going on with him. And anyway, what was I talking about? Immortality, right. Okay. And to be clear, I, I don't, like, actually have a, an issue with you calling them mortal, aside from the fact that, like, if you're talking about them technically, to make, like, a theory video or something, I feel like you should use the correct terminology, right? But I fully acknowledge that this is just a petty thing on my part. It's just a me thing, right? And part of it's because I just... Immortal's kind of a boring word. Wouldn't it be so much cooler if, like, the Vampire Legions were called, like, Eternal or even Ageless, I think, sounds cooler than Immortal. I don't know. It's, it's again, it, it's just a me thing. And he doesn't really consider the implications of that. He just thinks it's fascinating that they're so old and wonders how they could find a birthday cake big enough for all of the birthday candles, considering that 
You would need thousands of them. Which is obviously, objectively, the main concern that he should be having at this point, frankly. This is the first time in one of these episodes that we really get a really good indication of exactly how culturally different the gems are from humans. Their bodies are just illusions. They don't consider them to be more than just customizable holographic illusions like really high-tech online avatars. Which is why it's so weird that none of them are furries. No, that's actually a super good point, though. Like, and I, I probably wouldn't thought of it again as I was watching through the episode, too, right? But, like, the gems up to this point have just seemed like mysterious ladies with superpowers. This is the one where we do finally get that sense of just how alien they actually are. And it's easy to forget that, considering how far the show continues to progress beyond this, right? And how much of that runtime, this was all common knowledge. To, to the fandom, obviously, not to the people in-universe. But you, you get what I'm saying. Amethyst gets into it a little bit more than the other two do, but that's just because she's Amethyst. She is more earthly than the other two. Was this before we found out that she was actually born on Earth? Might be. So this, this is like foreshadowing of that. That's actually pretty cool. And he would not have made it back to the gems. He grew so old so fast and so decrepit so fast. He would not have made it back to the gems without the intervention of Lion. And I think that's one of the reasons I don't revisit this one a lot. Like... I think that Steven's ability to manipulate his own age, something that I'm 100% sure he could learn to control at some point in his life and therefore become an ageless being like the gems for as long as he wants to, at least. I, I feel like that's well within his capabilities, and it's very interesting that they gave him that ability, they, but they made it his choice where the gems don't get one, so that we can speculate about the character and wonder which choice the character will make and all that stuff. Also, it's just a cool power. I think it's a cool power. I think it's it's by far... Maybe maybe not in the long term the most interesting thing. It's learning about the gems is the most interesting thing overall. But immediately the most interesting thing in this episode... But the way they use it... To be just like genuinely... Existentially terrifying... Makes me... Like, I, you know I like kid-friendly horror. But, um... This is, this is detracting for what I should be talking about in the section when we're talking about the episode, but I want to get out of the way early. Um, this one, like, genuinely scares me. Death is scary in, in general, right? But um, seeing this cheerful kid character aging to death because of something as simple as feeling like he let down his parental figures a little bit once, th th this one time, and, like, Maybe little kid toys aren't for him anymore. That's scary. Like, I know it can't happen to me, but it, you know, still makes me wonder how much closer is my own mortality to, to what I thought it was. You know? Like, Steven Universe, especially at this point in its run, is not a show that I expected to make me question my own mortality. Is not the kind of show that I expected to question the characters' mortalities either. Really, it, it's kind of it's kind of shocking, and I've never really put into words prior to this why I find it so shocking. But it does make me genuinely uncomfortable. This episode, like, it's of interest to me because of those technical aspects, the stuff about the gems, the stuff about Stephen Stephen's powers, and this 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 one's fantastic evidence for. The subconscious power trigger thing. The subconscious power trigger theory, right? But I, I know all the technical stuff from this one. Aside from the the fact that there were humans in that portrait. But, you know, I mean, portrait's not actually that important, frankly. So I, I don't need to watch the episode again. And I, and I don't typically want to. <laughs> Revisiting it today is actually going to be an interesting experience, so... Go ahead and pull that up now. That place closed like five years ago. Uh. I know you put a lot of effort into putting faces on things. She but tries so you hard. Just a tad mature for this ritual. Go! <laughs> uh, I'll use it all the time. <laughs> it's for the pinata. 
The pinata is an artifact from ancient Aqua Mexico. <laughs> Am I getting close? Hiya. Yeah, I forgot about the Aqua Mexico thing. I didn't really, but like, you know, I wasn't really thinking about it. Um, that's interesting too. It's a thing that I like answered. What the heck is Aqua Mexico? Why does he call it ancient here? Is he just being colloquial? Man, this part of the episode is so funny. Like, you think this is gonna be such a happy episode, but then it like, it, it we're we're only we're only three minutes in, and that's that's three minutes including the intro, and it goes south pretty much immediately after this, and the rest of it is just existential dread. I'm not, I don't want I don't want to continue. I just want it to be. Can it just be this for twelve minutes, please? I can't be seen playing childish games like Wackerman Jr. I better stick to sophisticated games. Like regular Wacker Man. <laughs> it's whacking time. Alright, that part wasn't bad. Actually, this made me think of something. Like, the episode's being very... What's the right word? It, it's, 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 it's poking fun at the whole you have to give up childish things thing. Like, I genuinely don't believe that Steven is the kind of person who would believe that. He, he thinks he does right now because of that thing that just happened to him with the gems. But I don't believe that Steven's that kind of person, which is why in Steven Universe future, when he gives up things like, like, like the cheeseburger backpack, for example, that he loved so much as a kid, like I, I, I have stuff I loved as a kid. Like none of my stuff was a backpack. It's like action figures and stuff, which I'm sure none of you guys realize that I collect action figures. Just gonna just gonna wait for the ridiculousness of that statement to sink in for you. Moving on. Because I don't believe in that. I don't believe that you have to give up childish things as you become an adult. Just straight up don't. I um, actually detest any media that tries to imply that you do, that it is necessary. It is for some people, but it isn't for everybody. It's one of the reasons I really, really hate the most recent Digimon movie with the original cast. Because it, depending on how you read it, kind of had that message to it. And I hate it. Also, the villain was stupid, and they made a chump out of Omnimon, but that's beside the point. And so... When we started to get inklings that stuff like that was going on with Steven in the future, I didn't buy it. I didn't buy that as an organic aspect of his growth as a character. I just see him as the kind of person who will give up that stuff until like two, three years out of college and then realize he wants to reclaim some of that stuff and now he has to buy a cheeseburger backpack real expensive secondhand on eBay. Right? This part of the episode, though, is, is actually still pretty funny. Waiting for the dread to sink in, though. I know it's coming. I remember it. I remember it strong. Oh, oh. Sir, are, are you okay? I'm old! <laughs> yeah, and nuts. What's wrong with him? Oh, He's that okay. note drop. He's really, 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 really old. Check it out, B-Day boy. <laughs> I'm a tiny car. Beep, beep. I gotta say, as uncomfortable as this part of the episode makes me, I do absolutely. I, I have to call out. I have to. I have to give kudos to just just how great the voice acting is here, um, especially from um, uh, Michaela. God, um, that little warble in her voice as she's trying to be strong for Steven is great. Everybody's great here, but that that in particular kills me. Not, not literally, not like Steven is, is about to be killed by, by old age, but like, you know, in the figurative sense. I'm trying, again, I'm, tr I'm trying to stay in good spirits. Ugh, this, this is rough. Let's just, let's just get through this. Stuff. No, Garnet, don't shake your child. Hey, it's Hunk Steven. And it's stuff like that that, can, that has me 100% convinced that if the show did continue on to Steven as an adult and, the, and you know, there's still, like, battles happening and stuff, 
we would have eventually gotten to a point where Steven did kind of kind of just I mean we saw it a little bit when he was training with Jasper didn't we where he just kind of subconsciously altered his body to be at like whatever physical condition he needed to be as as strong as he needed to be right when he turned into Chad Steven um I, I do feel like that's a thing we would have seen more of the, the, okay this ending no, it, it's it's not not as uncomfortable as I remembered and there's more humor in here that does diffuse it it's just you know the humor has to come like every three seconds to adequately diffuse the situation and um man it's uh some pretty major foreshadowing that the thing that brings Steven back is the fact that he has to hold this group together isn't it Definitely doesn't foreshadow any of his emotional issues as of, say, future. Does it? <laughs> Jeez, okay. This episode, this episode, man, there's a lot here. I, I kind of I kind of wish I re I had revisited this one more in the past, because there's there's more to this one than I remembered. Um, this is one that you don't revisit a lot, like me. I actually kind of recommend um, going back and <laughs> giving it another look made me feel things, it made me see things in retrospect, made me think about parts of the lore I haven't thought about for a while. Overall, still not one of my favorites. I'm, I'm still not a fan of addressing the, the subject of mortality. But, but who is? But, um, you know, still still a good episode, I think. And I might have some thoughts. I don't know. I'm, I'm, I'm still putting them together, but I might have some thoughts for a later video. We'll see. Moving on to Lars and the Cool Kids review. Lars and the Cool Kids, the good Lars episode, which is where something happens that makes it safe again for a while, but the other gems don't know how, and they need to work out a plan how to move it, I guess, so... I'd forgotten about that, that the reason they had to do this wasn't because it had, like, grown out of control, but because, like, literally only Rose knew how to move it safely? Rose was really irresponsible, wasn't she? Like, she, she could have sat down one day and used her literal computer brain to work out a list of all the things that the gems we'd need to know once she was gone and then written out instructions for those things. And she just didn't. Like, I like... I, I've said this many times before. I like Rose as a character, but I just... I, I kind of don't as a as a like person, right? I, th I think she kind of sucks. Lars is there waiting outside for a group of kids that he considers the cool kids in town to come out and hopefully notice him. And this is why I like this as a Lars episode because in this episode it characterizes Lars as someone with genuine anxiety, which is a really good angle to take with Lars. I think, frankly, seeing how. I mean, anxious is a good word. How anxious he is to be seen in a in a very specific way by his peers. I think I think is is super relatable. It's it's probably the most relatable. It's it's one of the most relatable traits shared by or possessed rather by the the townies in this show. I think like I like this trait of Lars for the same reason that I like Sadie's whole thing with her mom kind of you know, uh, hijacking her life and and all, all of her, like, pursuits and stuff. It's, it's just... It's a couple of super relatable things, right? Not to mention that in an era of the show where... Like... The joke early on was that Steven really liked Lars. But we as the audience didn't get to see why we didn't get to see what he saw in this character but um th th this one humanizes it a little bit makes him a little more sympathetic and um while while we still don't really see what steven sees in him you know why steven looks up to him so much you get the sense that there's more to him than just that kind of jokey dynamic so he can't just tell them hey don't go into the water because of such and such reason which is so weird, because, like, 
you would imagine that the people of this world have encountered enough weird stuff that you could say, hey, there's some weird, dangerous thing up on that hill. We shouldn't go up there. And they'd just be like, oh, cool. But, like, that's... that's. I have a short list. Not literally, because I, I actually have to think about what it is. But, like, in theory, I have a short list of things about this show that never got answered that I would like to have answered. And one of them is... How much do the people of Steven's Earth know about the weird gem stuff? It really it really seems like there should have been some recourse for Steven here. And and there isn't. And it just doesn't make sense. Well, it's a little bit neater of a bow to put on the situation than if it were, say, a real case of anxiety. I still think it works fairly well to show that Lars does grow as a person here. Because at, at the start of the episode, towards the start of the episode, when he uh, bumped into Steven... He was nice to Steven. He didn't want Steven, like, stepping on his efforts to hang out with these kids or whatever. But he was nice to him. And it helps with that that we see Lars deal with some of these anxiety-related and image-related issues later in the show, too. This isn't the absolute conclusion of that arc. It's just a step in the right direction for him as a character. But yeah, I, I do agree with that. I think this one does its job really well. Uh, I say this is the good Lars episode, and at this point, when when I recorded this, the, the day before November nineteenth, twenty fifteen, probably, I meant that right because like Lars wasn't Lars back then, right? <laughs> he's a, he's almost a completely different character now, literally and figuratively, or by the end of the show, you know what I mean. Um, <laughs> there weren't a lot of good Lars episodes. He was just. That one joke I already mentioned, but just like the previous episode was one that gave us the first taste of just how alien the gems are, this is the one that gave us the first taste of how Lars might progress as a character. That it gave us an idea that there's more depth to him than what we've been given so far. And it does, it does that job really well. I think I'm just going to go into the episode at this point. This doesn't look good at all. Whoa. Yeah. Cool. No, no Steven, Steven. Wait, don't get near that stuff. Uh, Steven's here. Did they not you tell him not to do that? Steven. My mom planted this stuff. Rose Quartz used to climb that hill every spring and tend to the moss at the top. But now that Rose is gone, the moss is on the move. That's another one of the questions I want answered. Why? Why did she cultivate this moss? Like, I've theorized about it before, and I still think my theory is probably, at least, if not the most likely explanation, one of the most likely explanations that we have. But it, it's got me thinking, again, like, like why? Why did she cultivate this moss? What was the purpose behind it? She had to have a reason if she kept to it for so long. Like, they don't say when she first planted it, but, like, every year implies that she did it for a really long time. Right? It's just more stuff about Rose that, in hindsight, just kind of feels like it was only here to make her artificially seem more mysterious than she actually was, so that we would start asking more questions about her. And, in retrospect, I kind of hate that they did that. I kind of hate that they had to use artificial means, or at least seeming artificial means, to make her seem more mysterious than she already was. Because it, I, I don't feel like this kind of thing, the stuff like this moss, is stuff that they ever had any intention of really explaining. And that bums me out. She saw the beauty in everything, no matter how gross. <laughs> Fortunately, I know just what to do in this situation. Oh, that's... Aww. That eye was creepier than I expected it to be. Also, why is she doing this? Yeah, that's definitely gonna work. Good job. Steven, no, don't go over there. I hate you. <laughs> My name's Steven. Ah, <laughs> uh, he's gonna wreck everything. Okay, on one hand, kind of a dick move for Steven to go over there and talk to them after Lars said he didn't want him to. It's like a boundaries thing. But on the other hand, this is an example of like why you need a diverse friend group. 
because while you might not have the the courage or the the social experience or whatever to go and talk to a person or a group of people that you want to one of your friends might and then you can tag along with them and you can feel more comfortable because you've got a friend with you and that's kind of the situation that they're in right now and i i do, I do kind of like it i think it works pretty well because um like lars he's not being particularly personable to steven but he's not like treating steven badly until this point either it does seem like they get along pretty well even at this point in lars's arc relatively speaking I have no idea where any of my clothes come from. <laughs> yeah, man. Living free. I do like the cool kids. I find them to be very entertaining characters. And, like, this, this is our proper introduction to them, right? Yeah, it, w it would have to be. That's pretty neat. We're here. <gasps> you know what? Oh, no. Oh, how yeah, will they cross? Seem cool. Oh, pff. the police tape. <laughs> huh. Police tape. Yeah, that worked super well. Awesome. Good job, guys. I'm above the law. Lars, I know what we have to do. This is all your fault. I knew if something went wrong today, it would be because of you. Now I'm never going to be friends with these guys. All because of your weird mom. What do you know about my mom? That's a very good question, Steven. What does Lars know about his mom? That's another... That's like close to the top of the list. What does Lars know about Steven's mom? Because like, Steven's what, like 13 at this point or something? Lars isn't that much older than that. I'm, I, like I remember that this exchange was cool for Steven standing up to himself, or for himself rather, to Lars, someone who he seems to genuinely respect and therefore you would assume he wouldn't want to piss off, right? Like it's a cool moment, and I'm gonna—I'm actually gonna run this back for a second and watch the whole thing again in case there's more I want to comment on. But I—I'd I'd, I'd forgotten about that detail. That's a very good question. I—I I would like an answer. What do you know about my mom? I didn't even get to know my mom, but I do know she saw beauty in everything, even in stuff like this, and even in jerks like you. Ooh, burn. And you could tell, Lars is not so far up his own butt that he doesn't recognize, you know, he took things too far. You could tell from his expressions there and his expression right here also. And so, you know, good on him. He's not as heartless as he sometimes seems. Just there's, there's a lot of depth in this one is my point. And one cool action sequence later... <laughs> I forgot how often Steven almost died in these early episodes. And there they are. The flowers that haunt my dreams. What are they? Why are they? That's funny. Sour Cream says, I think I died. What if he did? What if these somehow brought him back to life? What if the purpose of these flowers was something along the lines of... I don't know translating Rose's healing powers into a form that would be beneficial to humans. He, she, she created these flowers to be like a gem-based medicine for humans or something. There you go. New theory about the flowers. I don't know. He's not pink, though, so I imagine he didn't literally die and get resurrected by her powers. Still, what are they? Why? I need to know. Rebecca Sugar, please tell me what these flowers are for. And why they have gems in them, please. So I can stop theorizing about it. That's it. That's all for today. These are good episodes. Genuinely solid episodes. I like Lars and the Cool Kids better out of the two of them. For sure. But they're both good. And there are more moments in So Many Birthdays that I remember that are actually genuinely funny and enjoyable. But again, I don't feel like I have a ton to say about these. They ask questions that the show never really felt prepared to answer. Lars and the Cool Kids more so than so many birthdays. Which is weird because I think Lars and the Cool Kids is better. But that's beside the point. I, I just kind of wish this show... 
Like when it when it did pay off its setup, it did so super well, nine out of ten times. But there are a lot of threads that it just left hanging for its entire run. And it's kind of still annoying. As per usual, though, guys, what do you think of the Steven Universe episodes, So Many Birthdays, and Lars and the Cool Kids? Did revisiting them in this video give you any new thoughts on the episodes? Did it remind you of anything that you had forgotten? Did you gain a new appreciation for one or both of these episodes, kind of like I did? And are there any questions asked by these early episodes of the show that were never adequately answered that you would like the crew to answer retroactively? I'd really like to know the answer to that question. It is a subject that I find fascinating. Now let's get a discussion going in the comments section down below. And while you're down there, you might as well like the video, share it with anyone else you think would enjoy my content, subscribe if you haven't. You can also check out links to my various social medias as well as the many ways you can help out the channel. Those will be in the video description. But either way, this has been AJ22, and I will talk to you guys later.